Good evening, students. Hope y'all are doing well. Um, anyway, hey, if you have your Bible, go ahead, turn to Luke chapter 15, Luke chapter 15. If you don't have a Bible, there's some in the back, um, and just because of how we work here, if you don't have one and didn't go up to get one, one will probably magically appear in your lap. Uh, so Luke chapter 15, if you want to go ahead and look over there, that'd be great. Um, but while you're turning over there, I just want to share with y'all a brief little story about my dog, because I love Love, love my dog so much. Um, not my dog, like, bro, that's my dog, bro. Like, my dog is in, like, my chocolate lab that I had growing up. Um, I had a chocolate lab growing up. Her name was Riley. Riley was, like, the coolest dog ever. Got her when I was, like, in middle school. Like, she, like, fit in, like, this palm of my hand. Like, she was so tiny, so cute. Loved this dog. And then, um... But, like, th through a long series of circumstances, like, the older the dog got, like, the less kind of time we spent around her. And by the time she was, like, about five years old, um, we really kind of really neglected Riley a lot. Like, we, we fed her. We took her out. But, we, like, we didn't, we didn't play f with her. We didn't, like, throw the ball for her all the time or take her for long walks. We just kind of, like, okay, Riley, go to the bathroom and then bring her right back inside. And um, it, it was a little bit sad. But, like, the reason for that is because, like, we were moving. And, um, they're, they're, and, and because of that, like, their, our schedules were changing. Life was changing. And it was just a really sad time. And Riley didn't really have a great time. And uh, a part of that, we realized what was going on with Riley. So we decided on Christmas Eve, hey, we're going to take her to this really cool park. There's a beach there. It's going to be a ton of fun. We'll throw the ball for her. It's, it's just going to be a blast. We'll get her a bunch of new toys just so we can, like, spend some time with her because she hasn't been played with in a while. So we're, like, throwing the ball with her. She's having a great time. And we're, we're packing up, getting ready to go. And we got this brand-new leash for Riley that had the little plastic cover on it. And somebody had called Riley, and the person that was holding the leash dropped the leash, and Riley ran to him, but the leash, when it hit the ground, scared her. And the loud noise, like, she, because of the loud noise scared her, she started running. But the, more, the faster she ran, the more the leash hit the ground, making more and more noise, scaring her even worse, until Riley ended up running down the hill, out of the park, through the parking lot, across the street, and then across the highway. Um, and then she went to who knows where after that. And this happened on Christmas Eve. Um, so like my, my family, my dad was a pastor, so he had to go to the Christmas Eve service and we all did. Um, so my dad, like we, we searched for an hour or two, but we couldn't really stay out. So we had to go to church and we're all like, <laughs> my, my dog, um, all through the Christmas Eve service. And then like a after that, like me and the rest of my family, we were like so upset that, cause we're like, man, she ran across the highway did she really get to the other side? And we, was, and we were really worried about it. So we were too sad to keep looking. My dad and my brother were like, no, we, we're going to find her no matter what it takes. We're going to find this dog. And um, about an, after another two hours of looking, driving through this neighborhood, they ended up finding Riley. They found her in this random person's backyard, and the leash had caught onto a tree. And, like, the first time, like, when Riley, like, first saw my dad in the backyard, she didn't know who it was, so she was like, doing that number, and um, that, but then when she realized who my dad was, she jumped up in my dad's arms. My dad's, like, holding Riley with one arm here, and the other arm, like, trying to detach her from the tree, and Riley's just giving him kisses all over his face, but, um, but we ended up that Christmas, we got our dog back, and we, it, it was something we didn't fully appreciate. We didn't realize how special this dog was. You didn't realize how much like family this dog was until she was gone. But once she was found, man, that dog was not like, there was not a day where that dog was not played with and scratched and loved for another day for the rest of her life. She was appreciated in such a new way and loved in a way that she never was before. Uh, I tell you that story for two reasons. One, it's going to relate to our lesson. I'll get that to in a second. And two, um, hug your dog a little bit tighter today. Just, you know, you never know. But, um, Luke chapter 15 is dealing with, a, it is with uh, Jesus tells three parables about something that was lost being found. And this sto these stories happen in really quick succession where it's just like, hey, there's these two verses on what the Pharisees are doing right here. And then there's like the whole rest of the chapter is three parables about um, finding lost things. So we're only going to dive into the first one. We're not going to go over the whole chapter. Uh, that would be very daunting. Um, so let's go ahead and just dive right into verse 1. And scripture says, now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him. 
And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them? So, like, right off the bat, this is getting, like, super intense. This is, like, getting pretty hostile right here with the Pharisees. Um, back Because back then what happened is if you would go through, you would sit with somebody, you would have a meal with them, you'd have dinner with them. It really just kind of meant acceptance. We talked about that a couple, couple months ago. But um, really what the Pharisees are seeing at, what they're really upset about here, is they're saying, hey, the tax collectors, the sinners, they're really messed up. And if you're sitting here in acceptance with them, Jesus, that means you are also sinful. Because if they're sinful, if you accept them, then you're sinful. Completely wrong, but it's what the tax, it's what the Pharisees would have believed about them, about Jesus. So let's keep reading. Verse 3. So he told them this parable, he being Jesus. Verse 4. What man of you, having a hundred sheep... If he has lost one of them, does not leave the 99 in an open country and go after the one that he has lost until he finds it. And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over the one sinner who, who repents than over the 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. So one of the really cool things about parables, one of the things I really love about parables is a lot, a lot of the times they're pretty self-explanatory. So it's like you don't need to be like going through deep dive, say every little thing, what it all represents, because it's pretty self-explanatory sometimes. But we're still going to do that today. Um, just kind of know that the general like structure of this parable is that, hey, there's a sheep that's lost. The shepherd goes after it. The shepherd rejoices when he finds it. And then there's a big party celebrating the found sheep. Um, but yeah, so they're, they're pretty simple story, pretty easy to remember, really easy to kind of summarize it like that. Um, but the first thing I kind of want us to understand about the shepherd here is that he pursues what was lost until it is found. He goes after, he pursues what is lost until it is found. And if you go through the Old Testament, there's a lot of imagery of God as a shepherd. If you want to go through, you can find some in Isaiah, you can find some in Ezekiel, you can find some in, 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 in Psalm 23 is a very famous one. But all through the Old Testament, you see imagery of God as a good, as a good shepherd. I just want to read you this one passage. Um, it's Ezekiel 34, verses 11 and 12. And scripture says, For this is what the Lord God says. See, I myself will search for my flock and look for them as a shepherd looks for his sheep on the day he is among his scattered flock. So I will look for my flock and I will rescue them from all the places where they have been scattered on the day of clouds and total darkness. Here's the thing that I want you to understand. This is not a new thing where God has pursued what is his. This is not a new thing where God has pursued after his sheep. This is something that God has always done. God has always pursued those who belong to him. God has always desired to have fellowship with those that belong to him. And, in, and what Jesus is saying in this parable in Luke 15 is he, Jesus is saying, listen, I am the shepherd, you are the sheep, and I will pursue you with everything I have, with everything in my ability, until you are found. One of the biggest problems of the Pharisees, not, not, not really in this passage, but just in general, one of the biggest problems they had, they had this twisted idea that in order to get right with God, in order for you and God to be okay, in order to be accepted by God, you have to fix yourself. You have to wash yourself and clean yourself of all your sin. You have to be perfect. You have to be good. You have to do X, Y, and Z. You have to do all these different things. And after you've cleaned yourself of your sin, then you need to go through and you need to do all these extra little Little things. These little things that God doesn't say to do, but we just think it's a cool thing to do. And the Pharisees would give you this super long list, and only then, only once you've done all these, all these millions of things, then you can be loved and accepted by God. And the crazy, the crazy thing about this is that's, that's not true at all. It's actually the reverse of it is true. See, Jesus comes through in our filth and our sin when we're broken, when we're messed up, and he calls for us. Jesus goes and pursues us while we're still broken. He accepts us in our sin and then prompts us to change. Jesus doesn't come and tell us that we need to fix ourselves of all of our issues and then we could be accepted. Jesus accepts us and then helps us through those issues and helps us change and he causes us to change. 
And the God, the God of scripture that we see from Genesis to Revelation, he's one that loves us despite everything. He loves us despite our sin, despite our rebellion, despite our, our, our best efforts to the contrary, despite all of our failures, despite everything, he is a God who first and foremost loves and cares for us. And we see that all the way from the Israelites who are complaining to Moses. We see that in, in, in the book of First Samuel where the Israelites go through and say, hey, God, we don't want you anymore. We want, a, we want a king now. And then God still loves them. And then even through all the kings who go through and lead them in more and more idolatry, God still loves his people. And then even in, now in, in, in Luke chapter 15, in the time of the Romans, when the people of Israel are compromising on so many places where God says not to, God still loves him, them. To the extent where God now even goes through and sends his son in flesh and blood to come to eat at the sinner's tables, to go to be with the tax collectors, the people that are untouchable, unredeemable in our eyes. And Jesus comes to sit and dine with them to go to find the lost. Students, God, he is pursuing you actively. And he will not stop until he finds you. God does the pursuing and we, we do the surrendering. The second thing I want us to see, let, um, let's go through, let's look at verses 5 and 6 actually. Um... There's something here that, like, I didn't notice this the first couple times I read this passage. And it's, it's subtle. It's really easy to miss. But verses 5 and 6, let, let's go ahead and read this. I don't want you to miss this. Uh, when he has found it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders. And coming home, he calls his friends and neighbors together, saying to them, Rejoice with me, because I have found my lost sheep. No, I, I want you to notice that. No, notice the chain reaction that happens here. See, what happens here is first, before anyone else, the shepherd rejoices. The shepherd has joy. The joy starts with the shepherd. This is the second thing I want you to understand. The joy starts with the shepherd, and then it spreads to everybody else. See, like right here, like I'm imagining that like the Pharisees are like kind of annoyed at Jesus for sharing this story because like they kind of under their breath were like grumbling. Like you ever like be around some people and they say some, something really stupid and you're like, She's such an idiot. And you just like kind of under your breath say something about them. Um, when Jesus like, hears what they said under their breath and then like calls out and has a whole conversation about it. So they're like a little bit annoyed Jesus is calling them out. But they're also a little annoyed because Jesus is saying, hey, these sinners, these tax collectors, these people that you wouldn't give the light of day, I see them as valuable. And not only do I see them as valuable, I rejoice when they're found. I rejoice. I'm the first one to be excited, to be filled with joy once they are found, once they are saved. And with that, with, with, with Jesus' response of joy when, these people, when, when sinners are found, that's a, that should also be our response, to celebrate with the fact that the Father, our Heavenly Father, the Good Shepherd, has come on a rescue mission for all of us. Because not only has the Good Father come through and he has rescued us, because uh, all of us, the, those who are believers in this room, but Jesus has also come through and rescued someone else who was lost and performed this amazing miracle. This person who was lost and destined for an eternity in hell has now had this radical shift because of the work of God. And they're spending eternity with the Lord in heaven. And that should be our response. Our response should be joy. And, and, and sometimes I, it, it can kind of seem a little mundane just because it's a part of church. But so often it's so easy to just kind of like, oh, someone got baptized. Or, oh, somebody got saved. And just kind of like, oh, that's awesome. Let's just really quick clap. I won't think about it again. But it is so vital. It is so important as the church to be filled with joy, filled with excitement that this person who is lost has been found. This person who is gone, who we never thought we'd ever see again. This person, just like my dog Riley, we thought was gone. There was no chance. Some of us have even given up hope of ever seeing Riley again. But now it's their back. Now they're found. Now there's hope. But just as the person who has been lost has been found and Christ celebrates, that's something that we should also celebrate as well. 
something else that I want us to look at in this passage, this, this, this sheep. I don't know about you, but if, if, if I had like a sheep farm, I don't know. Does, does anybody here have like sheep? Just raise your hand. Chloe, that's so awkward. You're the only one. Anyway, but um, it, for, for those of you who have just 100 sheep laying around, um, could never be me. But for those of you that do, if, if you like just like lost one sheep, it might take you a couple days to notice because there's like so many of them out there. Like 100 of anything, like one of them easily misplaced or it takes a little bit of time to find it or to even realize that it's gone. Because the good shepherd realizes right away. And it doesn't seem like there's anything special about this one sheep to us. It seems like, hey, it's just another one of a hundred. It, it, it's not that important. If, it go, if it's gone or it goes away, who cares? Like, it's not like it was like the MVP of the sheep fan club or it was like QB1 for the Chesapeake lamb chops or something. It wasn't like this super important sheep or it wasn't like this thing that was vital. But the thing is that sheep was important. The reason it was important is because it was lost. It was lost and needed to be found. And because it needed to be found, it was the most important. It was so important, in fact, that Scripture here says in verse 7 that there is more joy in heaven over the one that is found than the 99. In this passage, Jesus is going through, he's speaking to, he's speaking to two groups of people here. The, the, the first group is the Pharisees. The first group is the Pharisees and the scribes. The second group here, second group here is the tax collectors and the sinners. The Pharisees thought that um, tax collectors and sinners were terrible. They were horrible people. And like I said earlier, because of how awful and broken the tax collectors and sinners were, Jesus was also sinful and broken for associating with them, which isn't true at all. The Pharisees and tax collectors, they believed it because they didn't worship God the same way that they did. They didn't know the, the, the sinners, the tax letters, they didn't obey the laws, the rituals, the ceremonies like the Pharisees did. They lived lives where they stole, they robbed, they cheated. They did all these terrible things, which is true. The Pharisees were actually incredibly, fam- or I'm sorry, the tax collectors were actually incredibly famous for being one of the most hated groups of people in all of history. We, we, last time we talked, we went pretty deep into this, but I just kind of want to reiterate part of it. Um, basically, a tax collector was somebody that sold out everyone and anyone and everyone that they had ever known in order to get money. And that was, that, that's who they were. Then they, they were so bad, they were so brutal, that they were given Roman legions that, hey, if somebody doesn't pay you the money that you want them to pay you, send them to these soldiers to beat or even kill them. And many of the Jewish people, they believe that, hey, listen, lying isn't a sin as long as you're lying to a tax collector. The, these people were hated. They were considered disgusting. They were considered subhuman. They, they, they weren't even people. And sinners, they, 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 they weren't much better. They weren't considered to be much better at all. And, and they're not like sinners. Don't read that as sinners like how sometimes we may do where it's like, oh, well, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory. So, like, it's just they're just a regular person who sinned. That, that's not quite what Scripture's getting at here. Um, th- this is a specific class of sinner. This is someone who lives in a lifestyle of sin that is just incredibly incredibly far away from what God has pictured. This is someone who th- th- think think like a like a slave trader or someone that runs a brothel. Th- th- these are people that when you and I when, when we would look at them, we would look at them with such disgust and disdain. These were not just, hey, I got really angry at this person one time and I and 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 I I was really upset. This is someone that has done something that was just abhorrent culturally and against God. And there's these two crowds of people, this this one crowd who, you know, they're they they're a lot like us. They wear a button up, they got the khakis on, um, they go to church, they go to every Sunday, they're there for the Sunday morning high school Bible study, they're there for service, and then they come back on Sunday nights, they're on the Wednesday night Bible study, they're at every single church event. They don't only go to church during the summer when there's like fun stuff happening, they go the whole year around. And then there's this other group of people that they're icky. They got problems. They're sinful. They're broken. 
They're openly mocked. There's someone when we look at them, we're like, oh, what is up with that? People that the, sub, that the Pharisees would have seen as just subhuman and worthless. But the thing with both of these groups, both of these groups, that Jesus is needed by both of them equally. Both of these groups are equally in desperate need of a Savior. Both of these groups, both the Pharisees and these sinners, these tax collectors, need God. And that's the thing that's so amazing about good, the Good Shepherd. That's the thing that's so good about God is that He's here to seek and save the lost. It doesn't matter what's happened. It doesn't matter what's going on. It doesn't matter what is said. God goes out to search for the lost. He searches for them until they're found. Once they're found, that, that, that's kind of when it comes up to us, that where we have that moment where it's that come to Jesus moment where we decide, hey, I'm going to either follow Jesus or kind of walk away. But in this passage, we see that Jesus relentlessly pursues after those who belong to him. And that Jesus is overjoyed when they're found. Just a minute, we're going to go to our life groups. We're going to talk about that. But uh, first, we're going to go ahead and let's pray. Dear God, thank you for these students. Thank you that we're able to gather here tonight. Thank you that we're able to go into your word. God, I pray that as these students go into life groups, I pray that the conversation is productive, God. Just through your son Jesus, I pray. Amen.